You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast, another principles episode. I'm here with my little bro, Chris Reynolds. Hello. Coming coming at you from Boston. Uh, me at the uh, from the Ozarks, which is quite different than the TV show, but uh, but it's still good. And uh, we wanted to talk a little bit today. So, man, this is an interesting topic for me. I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of empathy and compassion. And for me, I really want to relate it back to strength coaching. And um, we haven't even said this much in in your background, but. You are a you are a pretty accomplished strength athlete yourself. Like you were really into competitive powerlifting uh, back when I was as well, and um, and you're you're a client of Barbell Logic now, and you're you're just a middle aged dude trying to keep up with uh, trying to trying to get away from dad bod, basically best I can, trying, yeah, best you can. Uh, but you got a lot of background on that stuff too, and um, certainly we don't have to relate all this to barbell training. But last week we had an article come out on the website about the importance of of compassionate coaching and it made me think about how in the strength and conditioning world specifically everything's sort of divided up there's a lot of like it's so goal oriented so you either see these like boutique type trainers who don't really do anything of value right They're, they're just there to encourage you and give you hugs and tell you that you're wonderful and you don't really train and when I say the word strength coach, often people will ask me what I do, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm really kind of a private sector strength coach. The idea of sort of a division one or professional strength coach is almost like a drill sergeant. It's a person that yells a lot or argues about the way we program or the way we squat or whatever those things are. And um, certainly quality of coaching and coaching knowledge matter tremendously but if you're not able to empathize and relate to your clients, they never see the knowledge and coaching expertise anyway. They shut you down early. And um, and so I wanted to address that a little bit. And then I think important for me to note is this doesn't come natural for me at all. In fact, I think we've actually developed a reputation. I think I've developed a reputation even of a very empathetic strength coach and, and I think I am, but I've had to work very hard at it. It hasn't come naturally to me. Um, would you say that you are naturally empathetic? Yeah. Yeah, I am. And why, why, why do you think that is or what makes you say that? Well, I, um, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Actually. I, I took a, a test actually, for those of you that heard the uh, sort of the interview with me and, and my background, I actually took a test when, uh, the most recent, recent capital partner, uh, came in that sort of did a personality test for us. One of them was, um, emotional intelligence. And I sort of suspected that mine was, was fairly high in terms of on the empathy side of that. Um, which also is the source of much of my own anxiety. Sure. But I have the ability to read an awful lot from interaction with another human being, both tone of voice, face, all these things. I'm getting, you know, 20 times the amount of information that your typical extrovert would. Um, And so, and I knew that already. I sort of knew that 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 would probably be the case. And the test results came out that, that it was. Yeah. So what is, what do you feel like when you recognize, man, I'm, I'm I'm more than average on the empathy scale. What does that look like for you for like your own sort of feelings and the way that the way that impacts your your life? So, you know, when I'm in in the room with somebody who's experiencing strong emotions of any kind, I I tend to think of it like my mirror neurons uh, that we all have to one degree or another uh, are firing at a, just an incredible pace. So if I'm in the room with someone who's extremely angry, um, I am very, very, very uncomfortable because I feel that anger with them. Right. The same would be true if they're extremely sad or, or whatever. I'm always 
reading the room and, and I think the source of uh, the difficulty with that around uh, empathy is I'm trying to, because I feel the intensity of, of the emotion that they're feeling, I also try to bring the intensity level down for them, which is sure. uh, difficult to do because I'm feeling it as well. Um, that's, a, that's a great example because that example shows for me why and why and how, or at least by experience, that I am not naturally empathetic. I am a super extrovert, a super type A guy, I can be very much goal-oriented, goal-driven. And there are times when I'm in the room and I am trying to control the room. And afterwards, Rachel's like, did you notice that the person had a stroke in the corner of the room and, and the EMTs <laughs> had to come in and carry? I was like, no, I didn't. Who? And she'll be like, yeah, yeah, somebody, somebody actually died like six feet away. Actually, true story. It just reminds me. Back when I was a junior high school teacher, I had a couple buddies who were also junior high school teachers. And you had to stand out in the hallway before school every day just to kind of monitor the hallway. And so I was talking to my, my buddies who were coaches and teachers in the hallway. And um, it was just a completely normal Tuesday morning. And went to class, and about fourth hour, third hour, the assistant principal, who was a great guy, who you know handles the discipline, calls calls me. He's like, "Hey, uh, your conference hour next hour. Can you come up and see me?" And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I don't like that." I said, "Did I do something wrong?" He said, "No, no, no. Just come. It's not anything really bad. Just come." Okay. So I go down to his office on my conference hour. He's like, "Hey, I want to show you the security camera for a second. And so he pulls the security camera. He's like, "Who's that?" And I was like, "That's me having a conversation with my buddies." He's like, "Watch this kid." This kid runs up to another kid three feet away from me, hits him in the face as hard as he can, and drops his ass in the middle of the hallway. No, no. Never noticed. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. He's like, do you know why we uh, have you guys monitoring the hallways in the morning? <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, bro. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so, however... Because uh, I, I really do, as uh, what has happened, especially over the last 10 years, is one, as I have gone through some really hard things in life, like that have to go through the, the tragedies and the, the th and, and the triumphs and like all of these things, you, I, I kind of feel the gravity of, of, of the weight of life. And so now when I am around people or especially when I am focused on the relationship and, and, and that extends certainly to my staff at Barbell Logic, but also very much to almost all of our clients and I find out that there is a problem with X. Now, maybe that's not even us. Maybe it's just something. It, it, it like their wins are my wins, and their losses are my losses. And um, that's very that can be a very emotionally exhausting. But what it's done for us, I think, is it's really set us apart at Barbara Logic as being the strength coaches who are a people company, who are about empathy and compassion. So, if you haven't had a chance to read the article about. Uh, coaching with compassion, uh, you know, this isn't something that, that a type A person can check the checkbox. It doesn't work that way. That, it's inauthentic. And so until you really can, can put yourself in the shoes of that person, you can, be, you can be inauthentically empathetic, but I think often people will read right through that. And until you can actually put your, their shoes on, and say like I, I really I feel what you're going through, then you're not going to be able to connect. And I think for me, my experience, and we've had Dr. Pewter on the show, is a, an incredible um, psychiatrist. It's probably the single most important thing for human connection, right? Is empathy and compassion, and it's it's lost in the strength and conditioning world. Um, you wouldn't say this. You you started to sort of you sort of put your big toe in the water because you, and you, I know you won't brag about your yourself, but most people are either high IQ or high EQ. And it's very rare that they're both and you're both and you're, you're, you're not a genius on the IQ scale and I'm not either, but we're above average significantly, but you're also way above average on the EQ scale. And that was one of the things that was interesting. I think for the capital partners that came on for you, they're like, we're not used to seeing guys that are high on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it, it I don't know what to say about it other than it's a, it, it's something that I both have, um, you know, I think everybody has some amount of those qualities that they're born with, 
but you also have a lot of work to do on yeah. both. I mean, when yeah. you think about the, the IQ side of that equation, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about reading. I read incessantly so that I can learn more and more and more and more. But the same is true on the EQ side. You know, you, there, there's a lot about, uh, there's something that ties those two things together. Yep. And that thing is curiosity. Truthfully, at the core of empathy is curiosity. It's curiosity about what the other person is actually feeling. Yeah. And, uh, and, and why they're behaving maybe in a way that they are behaving that you don't understand. And there's something almost, um, it's incredibly uncommon for people to suspend judgment, uh, on somebody else while they, um, while they attempt to read what they've done versus, you know, trying to judge what they're seeing. Sure. And that concept is essentially called, uh, separating observation from interpretation uh, and, and there, there are a lot of books written about this, but, uh, there's, um, there is a quote that says the highest form of intelligence is the ability to separate observation from interpretation. To fully observe yep. without, without the judgment, at least to reserve it for later to just be able to, to hone it. One of the things I've noticed for myself and, and for other people who have maybe aren't naturally gifted at this like you are, is if I'm in a conversation with somebody and I'm while they're talking, I'm thinking about the thing that I'm going to say next. That is a complete lack of empathy. That is, I don't really care about what you're saying. I'm already formulating my response to the thing you're saying. And so it's not it's not really listening and it's certainly not really hearing them and it's not being empathetic to their needs. And so um, actually one of the things that's really taught this is in my own marriage, like Rachel and I for a long time, Rachel and I have been best friends for years, but we had a hard time. We struggled about a decade ago with conflict. We conflicted poorly. And I don't know if it was a, we both people were trying to win the argument, but it wasn't healthy conflict. Now we weren't like hitting each other in the head with pans or anything. There was no, but it was just, the conflict would escalate. It would never deescalate. And we went to a phenomenal marriage counselor and she taught us how to really listen to the other person. And the only thing that you were allowed to say after the person spoke, after your spouse spoke, was to repeat back to them what they said, which is amazing because when you listen to somebody talk and all you're thinking about is I'm going to, I'm listening to you so hard that I'm going to have to repeat back what you just told me. I'm going to put it in my own words but I'm going to say back to you what you just said. And this is the way it worked. Rachel would say something to me and I would say, what I heard you say was, and I would say the thing and she would go, that is not what I said at all. And then the counselor would say, okay, Rachel, say it again. And she would say it. And then I would go, okay, what I heard you say was, you know, which, and then she would go, yep, that's it. And then the counselor would say, okay, Matt, would you like to respond? Yes. And then same thing. And I would say something and then Rachel would have to repeat back to me what I said. And it was painfully slow but what it allowed us to do is to never escalate the conflict because yep. so much of what you do is you, you read the body language or something and you, and you misinterpret what they're, you're not actually trying to listen and hear. Um, and the, and, and it's really, it's crazy how much I've taken from that, from literally my relationship with my wife, who I've been married to for 20 years and how much of that is sort of layered on top of my relationship with my clients. When I hear my clients com complain a little bit about some elbow tendonitis or, you know, they didn't sleep very well the night before. Like that's what red flags go up for me. And I go, Hey, what's let's talk about it. What's going on? And and we're proud of that at Barbara Logic. We don't do it perfectly, but I think one of the things that are really important to us, you know, we, we have people on our staff, their entire job is to manage in a in a in a healthy way, both internal relationships in the business and external relationships in the business or outside the business. And um, I think that's one of the things that's helped us separate ourselves. And so for, for, for some, for guys like you, uh, that empathy and compassion comes pretty naturally. For people like me, it takes work. And I know the saying of we have to be more intentional or there has to be some intentionality there has almost become a trite saying, but you, you really have to work on the thing. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you it, do. And it, at first, it might actually look like, I, it, you know, as we do more and more of these episodes, there are times for me when my emotion doesn't match my action. 
And those are those times of white knuckle discipline. And there have been lots of times on the podcast in previous years where I talk, where I kind of, I kind of shit on white knuckle discipline. But the reality is, is that often we we have to have it in the beginning. And my experience is that my emotion follows my action. So if I act empathetic or compassionate towards something that I'm not, over time my emotions follow and I become actually compassionate and empathetic towards those things. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's fake. And I think that if you're like that forever, you're a sociopath, right? If you're if you pretend to be empathetic and compassionate for months and years on end, like we, and you're not, you should go seek help. But for most people, I think the emotions often follow the actions. And so for me, the first step for me is just to be intentional about doing the thing, even if I don't really feel it. And what I've noticed is very quickly, I mean, very quickly within just a few days, my emotions and my feelings follow my actions. Yeah, so. there are actually great studies uh, that actually prove that that is exactly what happens. I mean, they, they even did studies that showed that people who were particularly unhappy that smiled uh, while they were unhappy had a hard time staying unhappy for a period of time. I mean, they, yeah. there's bo- a large body of evidence about this. The other thing that I would say that's an interesting point that you brought up is it's it's not always that we misinterpret what's being said. I mean, I think that's that's certainly a large part of the equation, but one of the other things we have to be very careful about as we work on growing, getting better in, in empathy and compassion is not labeling people um, maybe at all, but certainly not too quickly. Sure. Because there's this thing, I mean, our brains are pattern matching machines and there's this tendency that we have to say you are a X, whatever right. that X is. And I know a lot of X's and, uh, and therefore I know yeah. you and I know I what, can fill what's in the blanks. motivating you and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, you know, we, we, we want to do the best we can to stray from, to stay away from sort of religion and politics and those hot button topics. And, and especially, I mean, again, I, I mentioned this in previous episodes, you and I disagree on those things, but I think regardless of, of, of what side of the spectrum you land on, most people would agree that, the, that identity politics is a, has a tremendous negative effect on humanity. When I judge someone as you are this demographic, therefore I know everything about you, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I, I, I think back to Martin Luther King Jr. who said, I, I, I have this dream that there is a day coming when my kids won't be judged by the color of their skin or the demographic they are, but the actual content of their character, which means like just you, not based on anybody else who looks like you, who said a phrase like you, but like that's like, that's an incredible thing to be able to do. And I think really that's what empathy and compassion bring out of us is we're able to literally see the humanity in people and empathize with that and have compassion, even if they come from opposite sides of the spectrum of the political world, religious world, worldview, like whatever those things are, and see them for who they really are as, a, as humans. And uh, it's really pretty cool. I think one of the easiest ways to apply it also is simply to turn it back to yourself. If you simply turn your turn it right back on yourself, is there one label that right. you could put out and point to yourself that fully encapsulates you? Of course not. Right. You know, there are all sorts of groups that we might say we're sort of a part of or uh, groups of beliefs and those kinds of things that we have. But in reality, we all have a ton of nuance to those things. So when we're relating to another person and we are trying to be empathetic with them, the longer we can delay judgment labels, all of those things until we sort of understand that we can, we actually are understanding what it is that they're saying or why they're behaving the way they are, uh, the more successful we'll be. Agreed. There you go, guys. That's another episode of the Principles Podcast uh, on empathy and compassion. If you get a chance, take a look at that article on um, compassionate coaching. And uh, gosh, we need more compassionate coaches. So one of the things that we think about for our future PBCs, our professional barbell coaches that we certify, is is, is that is a, a big part of it. The, the psychology of coaching, the compassion and empathy of coaching is something that we take very seriously at Barbell Logic. And so for those of you who are clients of ours, we hope you feel that. For those of you who aren't yet, uh, it's there. And so uh, thank you for listening and we will see you tomorrow on Monday for another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. See you guys soon.